Welcome to Crime Salad Podcast, where we talk about true crime with a passion to spread awareness. I'm Ashley. And I'm Ricky. If this is your first time, don't forget to subscribe so you get notifications when we post a new episode. And thanks for giving Crime Salad a listen. And just a warning, this episode does contain discussion of violence against a child and child murder. Listener discretion is advised. You've been warned. So this week, we give you a story of survival against unimaginable odds. This is the story of Shasta Groney. Shasta was kidnapped, witnessed the unbelievable, and lived to tell her story. Her life completely changed on May 15th, 2005, when she witnessed her family being murdered, and she was taken along with her brother. And the next day, May 16th, deputies responded to a call at the Groney residence, not expecting to see what they walked into, which was a complete shock. Blood covered the walls and the floors, and the lifeless bodies of Brenda Groney, her boyfriend Mark McKenzie, and Brenda's 13-year-old son, Slade, lying in the living room. It was a scene of an unspeakable attack. Who could have done this to this family? Now, as investigators combed through the house, one shocking realization added a chilling layer to this tragedy. The two youngest Gronies, eight-year-old Shasta and nine-year-old Dylan, were nowhere to be found. So a desperate search began, involving law enforcement officers, state police, and even the FBI. Whoever did this was in a bit of rage. The scene was horrific. It had lasting effects on the community as well, knowing what happened to this innocent family and the question, where were the two young children? It's almost too horrific to comprehend. Oh yeah, it for sure is. And there's even more to the story that will make your head spin. A troubled man by the name of Joseph Duncan had been watching the Groney family meticulously planning the gruesome murders of Brenda, Mark, and Slade and the subsequent abduction of Shasta and Dylan. The children's ordeal in captivity was a descent into pure terror marked by relentless abuse and torment. Jeez. Shasta Groney was born on November 25th, 1996 in Idaho. She was the youngest and the only girl among four brothers, Vance, Jesse, Slade, and Dylan. And she was the youngest and being the only girl she had to keep up with her four brothers and they protected her the groney family lived in wolf lodge idaho and were known for their close bond often engaging in outdoor activities like barbecues hunting and fishing brenda and steve groney shasta's parents were divorced and brenda was in a relationship with mark mckenzie at the time of the attack Shasta once reflected on her childhood, saying how she was always with her brothers, and that's how she enjoyed it. Dylan James, Shasta's brother, was born on July 16, 1995. His mom called him her little teddy bear because he loved to cuddle with her. Shasta mentioned that when she was being held captive by Joseph Duncan, she would remind him that they would get out of there and to hold on to hope. Okay, so two of the kids were kidnapped, but then the rest of the family and the boyfriend were murdered in the house, right? Yes. So the mom, the boyfriend, and Slade. And as we mentioned, the monster who caused this very close, innocent family to shatter into pieces, Joseph Edward Duncan, he had a troubled past. He was known by the nickname Jet. And soon, that small bit of knowledge Shasta learned while being captive would be helpful to being freed. He was the youngest of five children in a family that moved frequently due to his father's military career. His upbringing was marked by instability and early behavioral issues. Joseph Duncan's reign of terror extended beyond the Groney family. He was later linked to the unsolved murders of other children across several states, revealing a history of violence and predation that spanned decades. Okay, so this wasn't this dude's first rodeo. He's no. most likely just a piece of shit. Yes, and it all began early. Actually, at the age of 15, he was sent to a juvenile facility for sexually assaulting a nine-year-old boy and stealing a car. 
During his time in the facility, he admitted to raping 13 younger boys. His criminal record continued to grow with arrest for car theft, rape, and molestation. Okay, yeah, piece of shit. Yeah. And despite multiple incarcerations, Duncan's deviant behavior persisted. In 1997, Duncan was involved in the kidnapping and murder of 10-year-old Anthony Martinez in Riverside County, California. And he also confessed to the murders of two half-sisters, Carmen Kubias and Sammy Jo White in Seattle of 1996. And despite knowing he was a known sex offender with a violent history, law enforcement agencies failed to connect him to the murders of Anthony and the two half-sisters. Everywhere he went, it seemed like evil followed. And it's like law enforcement weren't putting the pieces together. It was like he carried this dark cloud with him, affecting everyone in his path, and he got away with it. Whether it was acts of violence, theft, or just spreading fear, he was a walking nightmare. Yeah, so he's not your average hot-headed person. This dude's unpredictable. He's dangerous to be around. I mean, how many victims were there? It's not really known for sure because he continuously moved around and kind of stayed under the radar, but there are seven known victims. Seven. But like we mentioned earlier, he confessed to more rapes, like raping 13 boys. Like he confessed right. to that, but seven are known. Well, even with seven known, and obviously he's been apprehended once or twice or how many times, how is he not in jail? Yeah, and it gets even crazier. And even in 2005, Duncan was released on a $15,000 bail for a child molestation charge in Minnesota. He skipped bail and fled, ultimately leaving to the Grony family tragedy. The failure to enforce bail conditions and adequately monitor his whereabouts after release contributed directly to his ability to commit further crimes. I don't know, it's just crazy to see someone obviously with these early behavioral issues who, you know, spent some time with the police and it's just the system failed to rehabilitate him or even keep him incarcerated, right? It's so frustrating. And it's scary to think that this isn't the only case where a sex offender is just released out into the public, you know? He managed to avoid detection by law enforcement for many of his crimes and he often targeted vulnerable individuals and left little evidence right i mean rape and murder yeah. how are you still free to do it again well in some cases there was just not enough evidence to link him definitively to certain crimes i mean i get that but so there's yeah. seven of them and more it's irritating but without solid proof authorities they couldn't make an arrest right now, there were also lapses in the criminal justice system, including inadequate communication between different jurisdictions and missed opportunities to apprehend him. Although Duncan had been convicted and imprisoned for previous offenses at one point, he was released on parole. His ability to secure an early release allowed him to continue his criminal activities. I mean, I'm all for the police, but... There's so many cases like this where it just really seems like they're like, not my problem, different jurisdiction, right? you know, yeah. and then these things just repeat themselves. It does seem like a pattern. It's, it's crazy. Now, Duncan, he also used aliases and he moved frequently. So that kind of threw off the police and it made it difficult for law enforcement to track his movements and connect him to his crimes. So, yeah. All of that happened until he was finally apprehended after the Grony family tragedy. So the Grony family tragedy, it happened late at night on May 15th, 2005, when the family was most vulnerable. The Grony family was targeted by Joseph Duncan with evil intentions and a plan he's been concocting for several days. He first sparked interest in this family as he was driving across the Idaho panhandle when he spotted Shasta and Dylan playing outside of their home. He staked out the Grony family home for several days, meticulously planning his attack, watched the house for some time. 
before deciding to break in. It's terrifying. Yeah, like observing their routines, their movements, learning about who all lived there. Yeah, very messed up. So on that night, armed with a loaded sawed-off shotgun, a hammer, night vision goggles, duct tape, and zip ties, Duncan entered the Grony home. Duncan bound Brenda Grony, her boyfriend Mark McKenzie, and her 13-year-old son Slade with zip ties before brutally beating them to death with a hammer. After the murders, he kidnapped 8-year-old Shasta and 9-year-old Dylan, driving them to a remote campsite where he continued to inflict unimaginable abuse and terror on the children. This makes me think pedophile because maybe 13 was too old, right? Yeah, I mean, a 13-year-old boy is pretty strong considering, I mean, the two younger ones. Right. Manipulation and all that control. It'd probably be easier with someone younger. Yeah. Shasta later recounted the terrifying experience of seeing her family bound and helpless with a man standing over them. Duncan then took Shasta and Dylan outside to his car and drove them to that campsite in Montana where the ordeal of torture and abuse began. When the police responded to the call, it was Bob Hollingsworth, a neighbor, who was walking to the Grony's home to pay Slade for some yard work. And when he came to the house, there was blood everywhere, and he knew something terrible had happened. So I know at the beginning, the police the investigation they all looked into the the ex-husband right Mm -hmm. the real father and i get that but it's also there was so much blood it was you know a crime with a hammer it almost seemed like a crime of passion like it really added up to that and i think the investigation probably really focused on the ex-husband right from the beginning yeah and that's what the investigators first thought The two younger kids were gone. The attack was brutal to the family members who were murdered, the mom, the boyfriend, and Slade, her son. So it was definitely looked into for sure. Yeah, Steve Groney was Brenda's ex-husband and the father of all of the children, and there was a history of disputes between him and Brenda over custody arrangements, and it seemed to be a consistent issue between the two. So Steve, when brought in for questioning, insisted that the police not waste their time and look for his two missing children. And he actually failed a polygraph test. However, he had an alibi, and his computer records confirmed that he was at home during the murders. They even looked at Bob, the neighbor, who first called the police because I guess he and Steve had a little bit of an argument about money. Basically, Bob was paying Slade, his younger son, to do yard work, and it led to arguments and disagreements and tension between the two about money. However, he was questioned and quickly cleared. Okay, so you mentioned that there were the two other brothers. I think it was Vance and Jesse. Mm -hmm. So they weren't in the house at the time? So no, they were actually living with their grandmother at the time. Okay. Okay. Now, search teams scoured the area looking for any sign of these two missing children. There were volunteers handing out flyers and the community held vigils. The town was well aware of the two missing children and the murder of the Grony family, all while Duncan was holding Shasta and Dylan captive in a remote campsite in the Lolo National Forest. Not only did these two young children, eight-year-old Shasta, and nine-year-old Dylan witness the horrific murders of their family members being murdered, but he subjected them to weeks of horrific abuse, both physical and sexual. And Duncan recorded some of the abuse on a video camera, creating lasting evidence of his cruelty. He made the children call him dad and told them that they would be allowed to live if they obeyed his commands. One particularly harrowing incident involved Duncan taking Dylan into an old shack, wrapping a wire around his neck, and sexually assaulting him while being choked. Shasta witnessed many of these horrific acts, including the eventual murder of her brother. And she explained that it seemed like her brother got the worst of it. That's terrible. 
I honestly can't even imagine what these kids went through at such a young age. And then, like you said, Shasta had to watch it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, it's such a, a sick thing that they had to live with for the rest of their lives. And all for this dude's, like, sick fantasy. I mean, he's recording it, probably watching it back. It's disgusting. Yeah. He's just demented. Yeah. Un- unbelievably inhumane. Now, Dylan's exact date of death is uncertain, but it is believed to be around June 22nd of 2005. Duncan shot Dylan in the stomach with a shotgun and realizing he couldn't save him, shot him again in the head. He told Shasta that the first shot was by accident and Shasta was forced to watch her brother's death, adding to her trauma and realization that she was now alone with this monster. So messed up. Yeah. To witness such horror at such a young age is just unimaginable. The trauma Shasta experienced is something no one should ever have to endure. Shasta explained in an interview with Crime Daily, after everything she had been through, watching her family die, and now her brother being shot to death in front of her after they had been through hell, Duncan was planning to end her life as well and asked if she would rather be shot or strangled. And she made the decision to be strangled with a rope, hoping it would give her a fighting chance to change his mind. After all, she's witnessed what he's actually capable of. Not to mention her seeing the death of her brother and the fact that he just cold-bloodedly killed him. All of her hope for survival would had to have just faded away. Like, she now knows this is me. Like, like I'm going to die. Right. Like, this is what's coming for me. Well, Shasta was pretty strong-minded. So during his attempt, she called him by his nickname, Jet, and he stopped immediately. He walked away and said he couldn't do it. So I'm assuming this is something she learned just by him talking yeah being with him and you know found a weakness right so she had was smart enough to have the instincts to yeah eight-year-old girl yeah it's just to remember that and know it's like a vulnerability yeah it's crazy so it's now july 2nd 2005 now 48 days into the search 48 days of two children missing duncan brought shasta to a Denny's restaurant in Idaho for a milkshake. The young and confused girl, not feeling safe at all, was seen walking on surveillance footage. The trauma, the fear, and the loss were bearing down on her. Not to mention this is all at such a young age. Yeah, I can't even imagine. So a waitress and a customer recognized this young girl from the news and different reports on billboards and She called the police. The staff at Denny's managed to delay Duncan until the police arrived. And once once an officer approached their table, he asked for the young girl's name. Duncan nodded, prompting her to tell them who she was. And she was identified as Shasta Groney. Jeez, it's a hero going out on a limb, too. I think this is the importance of case awareness, though. I mean, that community had billboards, news, everybody, you know, were spreading awareness. And it was in her head enough that when she saw her, she recognized her. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, imagine if there wasn't the media attention or there wasn't billboards or flyers. This young girl could have died, like could have been murdered, found dead, you know? Yeah. It makes you wonder what Duncan was thinking though i mean was this a tactic like a hidden in plain sight tactic or was this a you know kind of throwing up the white flag and and hoping to be noticed and seen because he knew that they were looking for them like he's seen the billboards you know right shasta's survival can be attributed to her resilience and duncan's eventual decision to bring her into public where she was recognized and rescued and he was arrested on july 2nd 2005 But when you really think about it, she endured weeks of abuse, witnessed so much, and still maintained hope. 
that's a testament to her strength in a fight to survive. And even at such a young age, she managed to persuade him to change. During an attempt at murdering her, she called him by his nickname Jet, which startled him. He immediately stopped and walked away. Basically, saved her life. I wonder what happened there. Like, did it just throw him off or did it, like, make him kind of snap out of this psychotic blind rage type situation? Like, I'm kind of curious. Well, from what Shasta was explaining in an interview is, yeah, he just kind of, like, snapped out of it. And maybe that kind of brought him back to reality. Right. Or, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. So in October of 2006, Duncan pleaded guilty in Idaho State Court to the murders of Brenda Groney, her boyfriend Mark McKenzie, and her son Slade Groney. The sentencing for these murders was deferred pending federal prosecution for his crimes against Shasta and Dylan Groney. In December 2007, Duncan also pleaded guilty to 10 federal counts related to the kidnapping of Shasta and Dylan and the murder of Dylan. This included charges such as kidnapping resulting in death and sexual exploitation of a child resulting in death, among others. The federal charges made him eligible for the death penalty. So I would hope that he would get the death penalty just because he has a history, right? And he's even admitted to other things. So did he immediately get the death penalty? Good question. So... Even though Joseph Duncan pleaded guilty to the federal charges, including the kidnapping and the murder of Dylan Groney, the jury was still required to make a decision regarding his sentence. This is because in the United States, and it may vary, you know, a little here and there between different states, cases involving the death penalty, a jury must determine whether the death penalty is appropriate based on the evidence of aggravating and mitigating factors presented during the sentencing phase, which became effective in August of 2008. So the death penalty was imposed after a jury decision, after deliberating for three hours, and Duncan was sentenced to death in federal court for the crimes against Shasta and Dylan. In court, Duncan chose to represent himself, a decision that was controversial and challenged by his lawyers. The hearing included testimonies from various witnesses, including Shasta, who appeared via a pre-recorded video. Despite Duncan's attempts to undermine her testimony, the jury was convinced of the gravity of his crimes. Wow. And she had to relive all of that again. Yeah. Duncan's surveillance and careful planning demonstrated his calculated approach to the crime. He attacked this family late at night, wore night vision goggles, and brought with him zip ties, a gun, and a hammer, and different things like that. He aimed to maximize control and minimize the chances of getting caught. With preparation for this attack, it allowed him to carry out the brutal murders and abductions with chilling efficiency. Yeah, completely premeditated, planned out. He knew what he was doing. And he was charged for previous crimes as well. So in January of 2011, Joseph Duncan was extradited to California to face charges for the 1997 murder of the 10-year-old boy, Anthony Martinez, in Riverside County. And on March 15th, that same year, Duncan pleads guilty to the murder of Anthony Martinez and is sentenced to two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. On October of 2020, he was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, and in March 2021, he died while on death row at the United States Penitentiary in Indiana. From the cancer, though, not, yeah, Yeah. he got off easy. So it's a closed chapter on his reign of terror, but... At know. least she doesn't have to live in fear of him. You know, he's dead and gone. Exactly. And he can't do this to anybody else, you mm-hmm. know? Now, although that's the end of his evil chapter, Shasta, the sole survivor of her story, understandably, faced numerous challenges in reintegrating into society. On top of everything she experienced... The media attention was overwhelming, and she missed a year of school due to safety concerns. 
The trauma of her experience combined with the constant public scrutiny made it difficult for her to find normalcy. I mean, with everything she went through, though, I mean, it's it's got to take time. And I think that's it. The only time counseling yeah. can help her. I honestly don't think I could ever fully heal from an experience like she had. Right. Shasta's life after the rescue is marked by struggles with drug abuse and legal issues. So in 2014, she served a year in juvenile detention for a drug-related crime, which she later credited with saving her life. Despite these challenges, Shasta showed incredible resilience. She married, had five children, and worked as a supervising housekeeper at a hotel. Her ability to rebuild her life and to find some semblance of normalcy is truly inspiring. Her strength and resilience are inspiring to many people who have lived through similar things. But that wasn't the end of it all. Just recently in March of 2024, Shasta's home in Napa, Idaho burned down, leaving her and her children displaced. Oh, jeez. The community rallied to support her through a GoFundMe campaign, raising significant funds to help her rebuild her life. In a heartfelt message, Shasta expressed her gratitude for the community's support, reflecting on the collective effort that had helped her recover. Shasta Groney, the sole survivor of this brutal attack by Joseph Duncan, has channeled her traumatic experiences into efforts to help others particularly victims of violence. Shasta often speaks publicly about her ordeal, providing hope and support to other victims of violence. By recounting her experiences, she raises awareness about the impacts of violent crimes and the resilience needed to overcome such trauma. In one interview, she shared, quote, I want people to know that you can go through something so horrific and still find a way to live your life. It's not easy, but it's possible, unquote. That's awesome. Shasta uses her platform to reach out to other victims and families affected by similar tragedies. She offers emotional support and solidarity, emphasizing the importance of mental health and community support. She has participated in several community events and fundraisers aimed at aiding victims of violence. For example, Shasta was a keynote speaker at a local event organized by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence, where she shared her story and encouraged others to seek help and support. Shasta is involved in advocacy efforts to support victims of violence and push for better protections. She works with organizations that focus on improving the criminal justice system's response to violent crimes and ensuring that victims receive the support that they need. She has been vocal about the need for better monitoring of convicted offenders, reflecting on her own experience where lapses in the system allowed Duncan to commit his heinous crimes. Exactly. Shasta's interviews often highlight her journey from a victim to a survivor and advocate. In one interview, she stated, quote, I don't want to be remembered only for what happened to me. I want to be remembered for what I did after it, for standing up, speaking out, and helping others find their strength." Unquote. Her words resonate with many people who have faced similar hardships, offering a message of hope and resilience. So the story of Shasta Groni is one unimaginable horror of a story. and. A story of extraordinary resilience. Her journey from a victim of a brutal crime to a beacon of hope and advocate for others is a testament to the human spirit's strength. The community's unwavering support and her ability to rebuild her life serve as a powerful reminder that even in the darkest times, there is light and hope. And so the story of Shasta Groni is one of unimaginable horror and extraordinary resilience. Her journey from a victim of a brutal crime to a beacon of hope and advocate for others is a testament to the human spirit's strength. 
The community's unwavering support and her ability to rebuild her life serve as a powerful reminder that even in the darkest times, there is light and hope. So as we reflect on Shasta's story, let us remember that the importance of vigilance, community support, and resilience in the face of unimaginable tragedy is so important. And on that note, thank you for listening to Crime Salad. Make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening, and you can give us a five-star review if you feel like it. Join us next time as we continue to explore stories of true crime.